hell now we're ready this is the Zelcero de la Silla not light bitches but we are here with Craig Bell give us some hands for Craig Bell come on Craig welcome to Monterrey this is your first time no I've been here many 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 times oh when when <laughs> when uh I think it was probably Wednesday a Wednesday. Last Wednesday. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, yeah, like no. uh, years ago. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, I don't know. It was. I came here in 2008. Okay. For my first concert, that was my first time here, and then I came in 2014, uh, I think, for another show in Arena Monterrey, and then uh, been here many, many times since. You uh, perform in there, yeah. Yeah, twice. Twice. Yeah. Sold out, baby. Two. Yeah. Nice. So uh, let me uh, start. I I need to begin apologizing for my accent. I never studied English, so all my English came from movies. Oh, okay. And what movies? Hip-hop videos. Oh, yeah. Okay. And porn movies. Sigue, uh, sigue. So, <laughs> <laughs> see you guys, see you <laughs> so uh, you were born in Fountain Valley, California, in 1986. Yes. And you're the youngest of five brothers. Yeah. Three older brothers and, and one sister. older sister. Yeah. How was it like? <laughs> uh, being the baby of the family was pretty cool. Um, you know, I, I uh, well, I mean, having Did they three. You? Ha yeah, but have, also having three older brothers was a little tough. Uh, you know, uh, but um, but no, uh, but they're they're all they're all quite older than me. So I uh, I was kind of a like uh, afterthought. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we call it here in Mexico the Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah. Like a uh, lost bullet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Una bala perdida. <laughs> so uh, your mother was a, a professional pool player. Mm -hmm. uh, is she still a professional player? Uh, she teaches now. Okay. Uh, she doesn't play professionally anymore, but uh, it's because she, it's pretty badass. It's, she, she pretty much won everything that the sport has to offer. I mean, she's won two-time world champion pool player. Uh, She's won, you know. She completed the game. Yeah, she, she, yeah, she's <laughs> like, okay, well, what else? Now like, it's in secondary many... missions, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do you play pool? Um, I can beat my friends. I am not that great. I, I, I think that I'm good, and then I go visit home, and I realize, like, I, I'm <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah, my mom's Tiger Woods, but you should see me golf. Like, and then I golf with my mom, and it's like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not. I'm not Tiger Woods, yeah. But no, I, I go and I play pool I, I, with my friends, and everyone's like, oh, man, this guy can play. And I beat my friend and all this. And then I go home, and I've got them all cocky. And then my mom, I'm like, mom, let me play. You know, let's play. And then I just sit and watch as she runs a rack. And then I basically just rack for my mom when we play. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. I mean, uh, did your parents used to play together? Because if I'm playing with, uh, against my wife and she beats me. Yeah, well, my mom and my stepdad play a lot. But my... It, it, it's, it's really hard because my mom, well, here's the thing. My mom is very competitive. Nice. It's probably where I got it from. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, she's a pro, so yeah, she has so to. She doesn't play you like your skill level, you know, whereas, you know, if someone is as good as her and she plays somebody who's like in her family and, you know, we want to have fun and have a good time, she should play, she, you play them at their skill level, you know, like, but my mom won't let anyone win. Like she just can't do it. It's not in her makeup. So oh, no. that's she, the eye of the tiger. Yeah. So man. she's usually, but usually when it is the eye of the tiger. But when we, uh, when I visit home, usually it's like, like for example, at Thanksgiving, the family plays and my mom is just the referee. Like she just she she sits back and kind of like coaches. Okay, and, okay. And it's like, oh, oh, that's a foul. Oh, you needed to, uh, you know, and oh, like you suck. Oh, oh, you didn't, you didn't. <laughs> Oh no! You need to. It's more of a two. It's not a one. It's a two. Oh, you. Oh no! You didn't see that. You, you, like, yeah. So she's she's like on the side watching. And did she ever uh, encourage you to maybe become a professional player? Well, you know the problem with pool <laughs> is, and and my mom had something. You know, she was like, I don't want my kids to grow up in bars, gambling, <laughs> and turning into hustlers, and you know. Taking money from people and why not getting on drugs? <laughs> Sounds and, awesome. Well, my, my mom had a pretty rough upbringing. I mean, she started playing pool when she was 12 years old, and she. I would, mean, at home, right? Well, well, no. Uh, she would sneak out of her window and go down to Westminster Billiards, and she would play the pinball machines. Okay. So she's playing the pinball machines, and but she noticed that all the boys were overplaying pool. 
And so she loved playing pinball, but she noticed, she's like, oh, but I want to get noticed by like these boys. And so maybe I'll go over to the pool tables. And she started going over the pool tables and the boys were like teaching her how to play. And she loved all the, you know, the male attention. And, and then, um, well, she ended up getting really good and then yeah. beating all the boys. And then she became state champion at 16. At 16? Yeah. And state then, champion. uh-huh. Like then, uh, from, I mean, under 18 or? No, no. I, 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 I think it was just state champion at 16, Wait. yeah. Again, it wasn't like, old? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Yeah, I don't think they had a, I mean, mom, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to make you sound way better right now yeah. if, if I am. Yeah, he's gonna uh, the, uh, but no, it was state champion, I think, at 16, and then she joined the Pro Tour, and uh, in 1991 and 1992, she won the world championships back-to-back. -back. Yeah. So your mom is a world champion. Yeah. Nice. Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame, yeah. yeah. Is it hard being son of a world champion? Um, I don't know. It's, it's not hard. I think what it is, though, is like there's something that you aspire to with everything that you do. You know, it's like my mom always, like my mom always says, like, you know, you have champion blood. Like, you have champion blood in you. Like You do. You, and when you mention the eye of the tiger, like, when my mom is focused and practicing, like I remember back in the day, like it was just all day, every day, preparing for a tour, just zoned in, and uh, with me wrapped around her leg as she's trying to walk around the table, like <laughs> mom, give me attention. She's like, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, <laughs> like yeah, you know, and but she said it was great for her focus because she's like. You know, I've got all these kids running around the house. I've got one tr strapped to my leg, another one asking me to make them, you know, lunch, another one <laughs> asking this. And so when I go to play in the tournament, like, no one can shark me because. Nah, this is I'm, easy. Uh, yeah, it's like, I'm used to all this, this noise. I've um, been in hell, fucker. Yeah, <laughs> easy. We weren't that bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were just slightly demonic. Um, but the. Uh, no, there's like a champion blood kind of thing of where when you see something you want to do or, you, or, or there's like a perfect, like a, you know, with preparing for a tour or, or, or working with my band or something, there's like, uh, you know, you work till you get it to where when you go on stage, it's like, yeah, you're going to win the champ. You're going to win. You're gonna and win, how you know? come uh, the son of a world champion and um, your father... Uh uh, uh, not a world champion. Not a world champion. Oh. <laughs> well, just one world champion. Yeah. Uh, He's a world champion dad, but okay. not a... Yeah. And how, how did you become an actor? Uh, well, that brings my dad in. Okay. Uh, so uh, my parents got divorced when I was... So sorry. Uh, yeah, I was five. I don't, know. I don't even remember them being together. <laughs> it wasn't your fault. I remember them apart, though, trust me. <laughs> um, but no, I, uh, they, they, they got divorced when I was about five. And then my dad, my dad was, uh, my mom was pool, my dad was baseball. So my, baseball. my, my grandpa, my dad, my cousin actually uh, played for the, was a, one, of the, one of the greatest players in the, in the league. He uh, was a closer for the San Diego Padres, the Mets, and I think, I think the Diamondbacks. Yeah, I think the Diamondbacks. So he played on all three teams. He's, he was an all-star pitcher. Okay. Um, one of the best closers in baseball. And so my, that side of my family was baseball. And my dad, uh, having just recently divorced my mom, is looking for something to do with his son that mm -hmm. they can both um, enjoy and bond over. And so we played a lot of baseball. Okay. Are you good in baseball? No, I was terrible. <laughs> Hence the guitar. Um, so I, I started. He started putting me in little league and stuff. And, and well, actually, before that, we, I was, we, we would. One of my favorite things. I can't speak yeah, English either. That was Italian so, and Chinese. Yeah. yeah. I. Uh, so that the translator is what the fuck. I've been speaking. <laughs> Um, I've been speaking too much Spanish, so I'm trying to now think in English. Okay. Um, where was I? Uh, the baseball part, and oh, yeah. also why my dad liked master. baseball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I uh, we one of my favorite things growing up. We used to sit down on the, We used to sit on the couch at, at my dad's, and he would play me old movies. So I would. Okay. I grew up on Abbott and Costello. Nice. And Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin were my favorite people okay. of all time. Which one, Jerry or Dean? 
I well, I mean, I, I I got a little bit of both, and that's that's actually really where it came from. Is I would watch Dean and Jerry, and I'd be like, man, if I could do this, like if I could be the funny guy like Jerry, but also like sing and get the girls like Dean, like that would be like the perfect mashup, you know? <laughs> and and I grew up on all these buddy comedies, so I was, you know, uh, I, I don't even think I saw a color movie until I was, you know. 12, 13, it was like, when I was little, it was all black and white um, buddy comedies, Bean Crosby, Bob Hope, Abbott and Costello, Martin and Lewis. And so that's where I kind of like learned my comedy, you know? Okay. And, uh, and, it, and it's a lot of uh, physical comedy. Yeah, totally. I mean, Dick Van Dyke, uh, Dick Van Dyke. Uh, all, Jerry Lewis, I mean, the, those are my two, like, those guys could literally just make walking funny, you yeah. know? And... So my dad started, I, I, I started to imitate what I saw on TV and I'd make voices and do characters and, and um, you know, for Halloween, I'd be like, I want to be Charlie Chaplin for Halloween. And he's like, you're six. Like, what do you, what do you, who do, how do you know Charlie Chaplin? I'd walk like him and with my cane, I grew up, you know, we watch Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd and, Oof, and uh, Charlie, Charlie Chaplin and Fatty Arbuckle and, you know, uh, all, all, all the comedy all stars, and um, we. Uh, my dad saw, said, "Well, maybe you know, maybe acting could be something you you know you'd be into." But we didn't. We were we lived about an hour south of of uh, L.A., so we weren't like completely. It, it was accessible to us, yeah. you know. Um, but my dad was in a, a, a counseling session one time, and he was in the waiting room, and he opened up a parenting magazine and like in the back was like you know one of those uh hey does your kid want to be a star you know make you know <laughs> with our 40s voice yeah, right <laughs> yeah yeah it was like hey wah, 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 hollywood <laughs> come bring your kids and the it cigar i promise they won't be harmed for the rest of their life no! <laughs> they won't be permanent damage like trust me hollywood's a great place for them this bring them on down <laughs> And there's a big man with a cigar and some sort of curtain they bring you behind. I don't know why. I kind of blocked that part out of my memory. I don't remember what happened behind the curtain. But um, So he, he said, uh, oh, maybe this is something that we could do. You know, I could take my son to auditions. We could, we could, this would be something we could, you know, do together. And so we went to some manager. I mean, this is so, it's just reminds me, it's like old school Hollywood. You know, like we went to some manager and she's like this lady behind a desk and she's asking me, you know, do you want to, you know, would you want to be an actor? And basically what I was hearing was, do you want to be on TV and play with the newest, greatest toys that are coming out for the yeah. Christmas season? Do you want to eat the sugary cereals? And is this something you want? I was like just waiting for her to stop so I could be like, yes, yes, I do, I do. <laughs> Cereal, toys, I'm in. Candy, like, let's go. So, um, and that's how Hollywood gets you, you, you know, it's with the candy, yeah. <laughs> and so I, uh, I started acting. We got a manager, and we were going to auditions and auditions and auditions, and I wasn't booking anything for like a year. It was just, you know. Do you remember to... your first audition? I don't remember my first audition, but I remember my first, uh, my first role. Okay. And I was, I don't know, six years old, and it was for a washing machine company, and the commercial was like, you know, uh, you spill something on the shirt, and the mom washes it. And it's like, look, I got the stain out. But what okay, I had to yeah. do was I had to sit up against a tree stump, and I was eating popsicles, and the popsicles would like melt a little bit and like fall on my shirt. Okay, how many well, takes? Uh, that's where that's where I'm like, <laughs> all right, you know, they're handing me popsicle after popsicle, and then they got to do different angles and they got to do close-ups, and I'm just sitting here, and this is all I have to do is just sit there and eat popsicles, and I'm like, this is acting. This is like a dream. Job, I'm man. like, I am the De Niro of popsicles. <laughs> like, give me another one. I got this. You want another? You, you want to eat it this way? Day, eat it this way. I mean, I can. I can give you options. You know. <laughs> um, but it. Uh, I was just in love with it, and and just the atmosphere of being on set. I was just like the, the the you know the cameras and the lights and you know seeing what was on the camera and then looking around and being like, whoa, that's like. There's behind the scenes and all the, you know, and craft service and, you know, um, and the school was really easy. I was like, they have school on set, but it's really okay. just not, it's, it's like, like a two hours thing. Yeah. It's like a three, it's like three hours of some like, 
you know, set teacher, like, ugh, here, just put, do that, you know? <laughs> like, I was like, okay. He um, wasn't a teacher. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, was an like, actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I just, uh, I just fell in love with it, you know? And then as I got older, I started booking uh, TV shows. So I was on everything from, like, the Drew Carey show, uh, Seinfeld, uh, man, I can't even remember. I, but like, every 90s sitcom you know, you pre, pre-Friends, I was, I, was, I was doing a lot of that. And then booked my first movie, and then yada, yada, yada. Um, you can check my IMDb. I don't remember everything. I don't know, man. Um, they say you were from Santana. Yeah, don't well, that's my Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, don't, 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 go, don't Wikipedia me. Um, <laughs> but I had... Uh, but I, I, I had an audition for, I grew up on, I loved loving Nickelodeon and, okay. and all that and sketch comedy was just my, I, I loved SNL and Fridays and um, okay. Mad TV Let me stop and you. like. Who's your top five SNL cast members? Okay. Um, wow, it's yeah, 20, that's hard 50, one. 50 years of cast members, okay. Uh, well, we have to go with like some of the originals, like um, uh, obviously Belushi, um, Aykroyd, uh, Norm Macdonald. Uh, you can um, say some living people also, right? They're alive. <laughs> well, no. Belushi's not, but I'm Aykroyd, not. Aykroyd, and still oh, Norm's not. You're right. And Norm's oh, not. Oh, qué triste. <laughs> That's so sad. Um, yeah, no, Norm is one of the greatest comedians of all time, and his Weekend Updates, I mean, he was the by far the greatest. Yeah. Him and Chevy Chase were just the greatest Weekend Update guys. I mean, he's an asshole, but he's a great comedian. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Chevy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, Norm's a nice guy. <laughs> no, um, Chevy, Yeah, no, Chevy, yeah. But no, he, uh, uh, Jane Newman, uh, Jane Curtin, um, uh, Christopher Guest, Billy Crystal, um, Rob Schneider, Adam Sandler, Chris Farley, David Sandler. Spade. Uh, obviously, like the newer, well, not the newer ones, but um, <laughs> uh, Will Ferrell. Um, I'm leaving so many people out, but I just, uh, the, yeah. So anyway, I loved sketch comedy. Okay. And uh, that would have been like a dream come true to do that. So I got an audition for uh, the Amanda show. Amanda show, yeah. With Amanda Bynes, and, right? Yeah, with Amanda from All That. Now, on All That, I grew up on All That, and she yeah. was like a star to me. You know? She was like... Gilda Radner, you know, to me, you know, Gilda Radner. There's another great one, and so I, um, I, I went to the audition, and well, before the audition, they told me I have to create three characters, okay, and I have to write the material and come in and do these characters, basically an SNL audition, okay, and so I'm like talking to my dad. I'm like, three characters. But I have a hundred characters. Nice. I'm like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna pick three that are gonna really like show me what I could do? And ah, oh, come on, like, what do we, you know? So we we develop we we put together this like two minute monologue okay. where I go through like 28 different characters. 28. Yeah, I don't know how many, like okay. 30 or something. And it's actually there's there's it's it's online. Unfortunately, it was my second audition, and when I went to my second audition, like all the executives were in there, or it might have been my third, and all the executives were in there, and people I recognized from all that, and like Amanda was in there, and I was like, and so the audition that's online, I like get halfway through, and then I get so nervous because I'm like, I've Those seen people, all of these people yeah. on TV, and this is like the third or fourth call, like, I'm really close to getting that. This is the just, real deal. Then halfway through, I was like, uh, uh, uh. And that's my and stutter then, yeah, impression. And I, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what the, one of them goes, oh, it's your forgetful character. I was like, yes, <laughs> this is a character that forgets everything. Um, it's really, really a well-thought-out character. It took me a long time to f work on. Um, but so anyway, so I, I got the Amanda show, and... Uh, did two seasons of that, which was amazing. We did the first season um, with just me, and there was a, a, a girl, Raquel Lee, really talented uh, a girl, and then um, Johnny Kassir, Nancy Sullivan, and Amanda were the, uh, were the cast. And for the second season, um, I, I look at the, the call sheet, 
and I was the only guy. I was like the okay. only young boy on the show. The other guy was an adult, so he'd like play the dad roles and all this. So I was, I, I had like the, the pick of the, Yeah, I had the, you know, anytime there was a boy character, I was like, ah, oh, boom, all this right. This is my house. <laughs> yeah, so I look at the call sheet and it's like Josh Peck. And I'm like, Josh, that is definitely a boy's name. <laughs> I'm like, Josh Peck. I'm like, I, I think mean, there I was know the, the 90s, right? Well, yeah. So right so, now, yeah. Josh could yeah. <laughs> well, hey. be a girl. So I go, I go, <laughs> you can get me in trouble. So I go, I go, uh, I go, but I know this kid. I, Josh Peck, why do I know that name? Oh my God, it's the kid from Snow Day. Like, we, we, I, I met him in Florida. We were doing a, a Double Dare 2000 in Florida. Um, and it was Amanda Show versus Snow Day. So I'd met Josh before. And knew that you know he's this kid from New York he was doing stand up at like 10 years old you know and like killing rooms and so i'm getting like oh no like this kid's going to come in and steal my thunder you know like <laughs> dang it well luckily i'd already had a established characters totally Kyle Tony pajamas Tony pajamas. the hillbilly moment that was a mobster, like, right? yeah, yeah yeah and so wait actually i take that back we hadn't done tony pajamas yet okay Pajamas, uh, and so second season comes around. We start doing stuff, and, and and I'm I'm you know we got the block blisters, like everything I'm doing is still with Amanda, and Josh is like coming in as like kind of ancillary characters, and you know we, me and the the characters would be me and Amanda, um, but we come to Tony Pajamas. Mm -hmm. We we got this sketch for Tony Pajamas where I play this basically Robert De Niro type of Goodfellas guy, mm -hmm. and uh, Josh was my cons uh, consigliere. Consigliere. Consigliere, yeah, whatever. Con consigliere, <laughs> as they say in <laughs> Analyze This. Um, <laughs> That's a so, great movie, by the way. Great movie. Yeah, yeah. It's my consigliere. Okay. Uh, but he goes, so, shoot, I just thought of like 30 lines from that movie that are making me laugh now. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I was going to repeat one, but I can't. Don't worry, it's man. You can, you can do an impression no, of but the funny, Nino. but when he, when, or Billy it's, so, it's so funny when he's like, he's like, yeah, I have, I'm having an issue with my mistress. He's like, don't you have a wife? He's like, he kisses, she kisses my children with that mouth. <laughs> anyway, so she goes. <laughs> well, no, I'll, I'll open the sequel when he's with the mistress. Yeah. And then Billy Crystal goes and, hey, come on, man. I have a 13 years old boy. Okay, let me ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let me ask. Let me ask. So, so he goes. Uh, uh, so he's playing my my like counterpart, and we're just having a blast. So I'm like, we're, we're getting the, the the accents down, and like he's from New York, so super easy for him. I'm like a California kid with no accent, and so we're like having fun with it. And uh, we get into the dressing room, and we're getting hair and makeup, and they're slicking our hair back, and we're just. Flying, so we're just ad libbing back and forth to each other. The whole room's laughing and cracking up, and I'm like, "All right, I think I can vibe with this new kid yeah. in class," you know. And well, it got time to do the the, the scene, and you found the abbot of your Costello. Well, that's where I'm getting. Okay. So check this out. It was crazy. I we go in, we do the scene, and there and there's a part where so we're playing uh, like babysitters okay. that are hired to babysit Amanda. And we come in and she's like, I want to hear a bedtime story. And I'm like, all right, all right. So I was, uh, you know, I was riding my bike one time, all right? And I, and I fall off my bike. The kickstand goes right through my leg, okay? And she's like, ew. And I'm like, you're telling me, you there was blood and guts like all over the pavement. And, and she's like, ugh, I don't like this story. And then Josh comes down and leans over. And he's like, hey, boss, she don't like this story. And I'm like, hey, I got his. And then Josh, <laughs> he goes, she don't like this story. I, I, I got his. And then she, he looks at Amanda and goes, he's got his. <laughs> and it killed just the way he's got his. And I looked at it. I was like, and I just started cracking up laughing. And I'm like, oh, man. And Josh hates when I break. But... So, and he's like, he's like, oh, come on, man. Like, we had it. And I was like, I'm sorry, you're so, yeah, I didn't yeah. know you were going to say it like good, that. Man. Like, you didn't do it one time like that in rehearsal. <laughs> like, that's hilarious. And so he does it again. And then uh, he goes, hey, I got his. And then he does it bigger, just to, like, mess with me. He's like, 
he's got AIDS. And I was like, oh my God. And so I'm laughing again. I'm ruining the whole scene. And then I'm like, all right. I pull it together. I'm like, okay, we're going to get this. We're going to get this. And then he's like, he's got AIDS. And I held it together. And I smack him in the back of the head. And his hat flies off. And he goes, what was that for? And I go, for being an idiot. And he just goes, okay. And the way he says, okay, I crack up again. And I'm dying laughing. And, and Josh is like, come on, man. And I'm like, dude, when did you, like, you're, you're killing me. It's like, it's so funny. So anyway, finally, I, ha I go to like two or three of those where I'm breaking because it's so funny. And then finally, we get through the whole thing. The, the audience is dying, the, the crew, camera crew, everyone's laughing, cracking up. And, and I look over to Josh and I'm like, and like, I swear, like everything went like silent on the set. And this like beam of light from like, from the comedy gods in heaven, nice. like shine down on Josh. And I looked at him and I was like, oh my God. He's talking really loud. Is he in the club still? <laughs> My friend, my friend, he, he works in clubs. Oh, yeah. And, and he, he talks as if he's always in a club. Like, he, he, I, he, like he's two rooms away, and, and I can yeah. hear him. It's crazy. Uh, uh, he's drunk. Yeah, well, and yeah. He, that, that too. I mean, you had to face all. Exactly. Bars. But so the, 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 the light is shining down, and I'm like, no way. Like, <laughs> bro. <laughs> The club when was last la night. Um, I'm sorry, but it is your fault. <laughs> it's my fault. I, I, I'm not going to apologize for your fault. I brought him. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so, on you, man. <laughs> yeah. So, no. Um, but I looked at Josh, and I was like, oh, my God. This is what I grew up on. This is what I've always wanted. I've always wanted, like, the Abbott to my, the, but, the, the Costello to my Abbott, the Lewis to my Martin. Like, oh, my God. Like, this is, this is freaking it. Like, no way. And so we started to get paired together more, and then it became like, anytime we had something to do, Josh, they try to put Josh and I together as much as we could. Okay. And every time we had something to do, we just started riffing off each other. He was so funny. We could we could ad lib. We could make th like it, it was just we were like perfect for each other. Yeah. And so later on, we became uh, we got the offer from the executive producer and asked, you know, would you guys like to be on your own show and do your own yeah. thing? And I was like, uh, yeah, like, of course. And then we went on to be Drake and Josh. And it was, it's just crazy, like, growing up and watching all of these buddy duos, um, just dreaming of one day being able to do something like that, and then becoming a part of, like, you know, not yeah. to, to... Your own I legacy. Mean, yeah. people, people tell me, you know, like, one of the most iconic comedy duos. Yeah. In town, you know, uh, so it was, it, it was like, I mean, it, it's like living in a, in a, in, in a dream, in you know. In a dream. I saw an interview when you said um, the, the idea of the Drake and Josh show uh, went from this fight over a shrimp. It yeah. It was a sketch. Yeah, so, well, that's actually, that's how it came about. So we were doing an episode of Amanda where we, we would often play ourselves and give, like, a behind-the-scenes kind of feel for the show. Okay. And in the script, it said, Drake and Josh fight over a shrimp. Like, a shrimp falls from the sky, and Drake and Josh fight over it. And there's no dialogue or anything. It was just, that it was, was it. Okay, this is full impro. Yeah. All right. And so, you know, we were walking, and there's a... And to preface this, Nickelodeon had told the executive producer they wanted... They were looking for, like, a buddy comedy. So if he had any ideas, and they're asking other, they're looking at other stuff, uh, uh, writers and stuff, um, for a buddy comedy. So Josh and I are walking along, and this is like cooked crustacean, you know, kind of falls to the, to the floor from the heavens. I don't know why. Um, but, you know, Josh looks and he's like, hey, a shrimp. And I'm like, huh, I want it. <laughs> and then Josh is like, no, but I want it. I'm like, no, I want it. And then we just go into this full-on, you know, brawl over okay. the shrimp where Josh is like, you know, like, I enjoy shellfish. And I'm like, stop, there's, you know, stay away from the shrimp. There's nothing to see here. And we're just riffing, you know. And one of the writers leaned over to the executive producer and, like, kind of, you know, was mm -hmm. like, hey, 
there's your buddies right there. And, uh, and so that gave him the idea to write Drake and Josh, and he, uh, he wrote a pilot, presented it to us, and... And you we were, did that sketch on the fourth season of Drake and Josh. On the last, that was actually the very last thing that we ever did on the Drake. Before we, we, we came, we did come back for uh, Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh, and... Uh, for the movies, right? For the, for, for the movie. But the last thing that we shot on Drake and Josh was the episode Really Big Shrimp, um, and Megan brings the shrimp in the, at the end of the episode, Megan brings the shrimp into the, the room, and we walk in, and there's one shrimp left, and we fight over the shrimp. So, okay. And it was really a, a, a kind of emotional when, when, because everybody who was working on the show worked on Amanda show with okay. us, and we grew up, we were, we, yeah, everyone was the same. So we were a huge family. And it was just really, sentimental to have us fighting over the shrimp mm -hmm. and this then is how this began. yeah and it's like how we started and then we fight over the shrimp and we end the scene and uh we got up and everyone's applauding and it was just and you know crying and how you you know when you wrap a show it's it's you know, really sentimental. I imagine it's, it's really hard. You it's, know? it's hard because it's your family. You're with them every day, especially in our formative years. You know, when we've How been many there, years you work at? We were there for five years. Five we years, did okay. from, I started Drake and Josh when I was 15, and we ended when I was either about to turn 20 or I just turned 20. Okay. Um, and so we did it for five years, and, and it was just really sentimental, like how goofy of, like, we're fighting over this grilled shrimp <laughs> and cocktail sauce and 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 at the end you know we kind of just like looked at each other looked at the set and was like wow what a trip like this is really the end of an era and how we all how we got here how we started and it was a nice little button for the end to to kind of end it how we how we began i know i mean i i don't know i, I never been in a series <laughs> so long yeah I mean, <laughs> And trying to be empathic, all right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, do you have any favorite episode of Rake and Joe's? And, um, and the least favorite episode? I don't know if I have a least favorite episode. I think my most favorite episode is the, the treehouse episode. Um, I really like Vicious Tiberius, the one with the dog mm -hmm. that uh, we have to go babysit the dog at Miss Hafer's house. Um, Because I think anywhere that we, Josh and I are in clo like close quarters and we're stuck somewhere, okay. and there's not much to do, but it's just all us playing off of each other, uh, I, I mean, I, it just makes me laugh. I, I, the, us being stuck in the bathroom mm -hmm. and being afraid of the dog and trying to figure out how to get out of the bathroom, and then he's, you know, counts down from three to one. He's like, all right, I'm going to open the door on three, and then... I'm like, one, two, three, and I slam it to the door, and I'm like, dude, and he's like, you didn't say go, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> one, two, three, go, all right, and so, but just these, like, simple uh, scenarios, just, I don't know, we, 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 we really fed off of those, like, finding the comedy where there, you know, there's not a joke, and mm -hmm. that's, I think what we did so well was there's so many times where, like, you know, obviously we see the written joke, but... Josh and I would get together, and we got to a point where like, we didn't even have to talk to each other. We would just like give each other a look, and I'd be like, "Oh, okay, I know what you're gonna do with this. All right, I'll set you up for it, or nice. vice versa." You know, like I would know. I'd be like, "He'd be like, wait, wait." I was thinking, I'm like, "Don't worry, I'll set you up. I got it. Like, I got I, you. I, I know, yeah. I know exactly what's in your brain right now." And it's crazy because even years later. When I went to do Grandfathered with Josh. Oh, yeah, you did a cameo. I did an episode of Grandfathered, and we hadn't worked together for 10 years, you know? And we, we got on set, and it was like we never stopped. I mean, the second I got on the set with him and we started doing our scene, I was like, whoa, like, this is weird. Like, <laughs> I, I, like, We have such a kid, like, we're so simpatico when we're on, when we're on screen together yeah. that there's just, it, it just was so natural. And I was like, like, whoa, like, we still have that connection, you know? And, and it wasn't the script uh, that you said, you remember my stepbrother? No, we, they didn't have a good button for the end of the scene. 
Um, and so me and Josh, I kind of like pulled Josh aside. I was like, I was like, well, dude. And the writers kept giving us different lines mm-hmm. to, to end the scene. And it, nothing was really like hitting as like the last, you know, because there's always like the button of a sitcom, the button of a scene is like that you got to leave you on a joke, yeah. you know? And it just wasn't hitting. And so I pulled Josh aside. I was like, I was like, dude, let's just give him some suggestions. Like, and then I thought I was like, well, I was like, let's just do a, let's just look. I'm let's here. Do our thing. I'm, I'm here for the fan. I'm, like, obviously, like, this is like a cool thing for the Drake and Josh fans. So I'm like, let's just throw in a Drake and Josh reference. I'm like, let's just do that. And then uh, I was like, why don't you like start to walk in? And I go, you know, you, you remind me of my brother. And then you know, and then Josh was like. Uh, you know, I was like, say something like, oh, well, why is he, is he really cool? Mm-hmm. And then I'll just be like, no, he's in jail for stalking Oprah. Ooh. And then everyone was like, oh, my God, like, that's the joke. They're yeah. like, yes, that's the one. And then so we, re- we, we, we taped a bunch of different lines. But when I watched the show, I was like, yes, my line got in there. <laughs> they used the Oprah line. Now I'm a writer. Yeah, and now is, fans, yeah, yeah and, now, and now fans always reference that episode of like, yeah, I mean, it was, oh, great it was such fans. a great throwback. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how, how often do you get asked to do the wow? Just take it easy, man. Oye, tranquilo, viejo. Well, uh, tonight I think was nine hundred thousand three hundred and thirty-two. Are you tired? Um, no, I love it. I love it. I, 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 it's to be able to have such iconic lines because you always grow up. All the shows you watched growing up mm-hmm. had these like catchphrases, catchphrases that yeah. you that you loved and made you feel nostalgic, and you couldn't wait for the characters to say them and. And so, no, I love it. And it's really interesting. We were talking before we started uh, filming just a minute ago about, like, watching shows in different translations mm-hmm. and how some don't really translate well. Like, something's really funny in yeah, English something or lost. something's really funny in Spanish, and then you translate it to English, and you're like, huh? And then you translate it to Spanish, you're like, what? This isn't funny. Um, but for some reason, Drake and Josh did it really well. And um, they uh, also, I think, I mean, Lalo... Who who played Drake? I mean, uh, played Josh on on the he did the voice of Josh and okay. he directed the Lalo. Yes, yeah, did the Lalo, Lalo. did the uh, the version here in Mexico, and he just did an incredible job. Like he got the voices right, he got the cadence right. Like the the guy who played Drake, um, Enzo. Yeah, Enzo. He he um, he killed it. Like he had the he had the He's good, right? he had the the like I would watch it and I'm like, is that me speaking in Spanish? Like it sounds like my voice. That's exactly how I would have delivered the line, and it's funny because it translates really well. And so in America, it's a different line, but it kind of means the same thing. But it's whoa, just take it easy, man. And mm-hmm. here it's oye, tranquilo, viejo. <laughs> I think it's funnier. In, ah! I think it's funnier in Spanish. I just have a semi hard. <laughs> <laughs> Así se dice, se me paró tantito. You know I speak enough Spanish to understand what you're saying. How um, oh, did you? So, uh, this is a late night show, right? Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't There's watch no this at breakfast. You, you can be um, free. Come on. So, uh, uh, <laughs> I totally lost my train of thought now. Where was I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Oye, tranquilo. Viejo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but it translates, but, but it, people love that line in, in, in English. I, yeah. So when I'm in, in America, people are always like, Hey, can you, can you uh, do a video with me where we say, Whoa, just take it easy, man. And then here it's, Oh, what is this? Oye, tranquilo, viejo. And it's like, and, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's a daily, daily, yeah, they, they daily request. Version with one of my, my catchphrases. Oh yeah. Yeah. That when I will start doing comedy, I mean. Uh, becoming, como se dice viral? Viral. Viral. Yeah. So uh, they put my face, uh, or just the hat, I, I don't remember, but they say, oye, tranquilo, puñetas. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they send it to me, I'm, I'm like I'm nine years ago. <laughs> I love it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds better. <laughs> uh, I have to be honest with you, uh, I I didn't watch the show when they uh, he came out. No, 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 man, man, come on, man. Wait, wait, wait. I, I had to explain. Uh, <laughs> mainly because I was in my twenties. Uh, I was working yeah. and I didn't have cable. So mm. yeah. So I. I <laughs> but I started uh, watching the show with my kids. 
and, and my daughter Azul is uh, she's a huge fan. And uh, but I'm more a uh, fan of your music, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't like 10, 15 years ago. I started listening to your songs, but I have to say, um, I mean, um, como como lo digo para no cagarla. Eh. Okay, no lo digo. No, no, no. I mean, uh, by the ocean is the last one. Uh huh. I have to ask: Is that uh, did you were influenced by soul or funk or? Um, well, I, I have a very eclectic uh, um, taste in music, so I, I I'm pretty much influenced by everything. Okay. Um, but but this song, I, my new album has. It, it's basically like a diary, you know. Okay. Like I don't write in a diary. I, I write songs, so uh, they're all about my life. I mean, you can go back to Telegraph, my first album, my second album, you, and you know, some heavy stuff. And it's just my, I just I can only write about the experiences I'm having in my life, you know. And uh, but this album is really lengthy it's it's 25 songs okay and i started writing it like three years ago started working on it and i didn't know if i was going to make a record i was just writing songs and then just song after song after song kept coming and then i'd record and then i'd be like oh cool these are great 10 songs for this new album and then i'd write five more and then i'd be like oh well okay now it's 15 songs because these have to go on the record and then i'd write five more and i'm like all right it's 20 songs like okay but those have to go on the record because geez these are, i mean this is what's going on and then stuff kept happening in my life and then Ended up being like a crazy record. And I'd gone into the studio and I was like just mentally exhausted, you know, and emotionally just like worn out. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't want to write a song today that's like gonna like tear my soul apart. Okay. You okay. Know? It's like I just wanna have fun. Yeah. Like I just wanna just goof off and screw around in the studio. And so we came up with this like and I was like, I was like, yeah, let's just do something like this funny stupid funky thing okay and then i was like all right but what are the lyrics gonna be you know i'm like all right well i'm like i don't know just give me the microphone and i'll just like riff and if stuff comes out like and it's good like whatever so i was like dun -dun 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 -dun. and a lot of times when you write lyrics you're like you kind of just go like dun -dun 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 -dun. but i go but i got no money and you're like oh i got no money okay that that works hang on right down. okay <laughs> that's okay true. I got no money yeah, it's <laughs> very true. So, you know, I got no money. And I'm like, okay, that works. And I was like, 20, but the other thing sounded like bunny. Like, oh, okay, okay, 24, oh, 24 carats makes you my bunny. Like, like a 24 carat ring, but like bunny, like, like, a, like makes you my girl. Like, okay, but it's carrots and bunnies like carrots. And I'm like just goofing off, okay. you know? And then, and then the, uh, but I got no money. Uh, and then I love the show Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's like okay, one of my yeah, favorite it's a great shows. Show. Are you a fan of Larry Davis, right? Of who? Of Larry Davis. Larry. Oh, I love of Curb. Yeah. Curb's my show. Dude. Okay, okay. Like that's yeah. I mean, I love Larry okay, Davis. Okay, okay. He's a genius. Um, but so. Uh, and I ask that because uh, some people doesn't like the acid humor. Yeah, like that style. They like, don't like villains. Yeah. And they are villains. Yeah. Oh, always sunny villains. Oh, they're, they're, they're villains. Yeah. Assholes. Total, total, total. Yeah. I love that style of humor. And yeah. A lot of people, a lot of my friends, you're right. Like, they're like, oh, I don't like Kirby enthusiasm. It makes me really uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, that's a point. Yeah. Like, that's the point. Like, Larry says everything that's in our heads that we won't say in public because we'd be an asshole. And there's no script. Yeah. And there's no, I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. Um, with how funny it is and the way to have no script is incredible. Though everyone on that show is amazing. Um, but so I love I always sunny in Philadelphia, and so I was like, uh, "We're gonna make you my money. It's more bees with honey. Uh, the that's carrots. good because I got no but because I got no money." And then I was like, "Something, something sunny." I was like, "Oh, like Philly. I'm always sunny, you know." Okay. And so I threw that in, and then when we got to the chorus, I was like, "Spend my last dollar on this bus to the beach." And I'm like, "Okay, what rhymes with beach?" I was like. Each, teach, bleach. Bit. I'm like bleach, bleach rhymes with beach, but what the fuck are you gonna do with bleach at the beach? And I was like, whatever. Let's just try it. And I was like, so I brought my hand sanitizer and a bottle of bleach, and then, 
everyone's like, people are like, why? Yeah, people are like, why are you bringing hand sanitizer and a bottle of bleach to the beach? I'm like, obviously, you've never been to beaches in Los Angeles. Nice. Because, because <laughs> let me tell you, <laughs> you, you go to bleach. Venice, you go to Venice, you need like like a tub of of, of hand sanitizer and a tub <laughs> and of a bleach gas mask. and a gas mask just to <laughs> get through it. Um, but so no, it was just nonsense. You know, I was just saying nonsense, and I had a lot of fun with it. And I thought it was a total ridiculous song that I would never release. And I was like, this is just a, like I was just messing around today. But then I got in the, I was in the car with some friends, and I'm like, hey, you guys want to hear this stupid song I just wrote? It's like totally ridiculous. <laughs> and I played it, and everyone was like, oh, shit. Like, they're like, dude, play that again. Like, yeah, this is the, oh, no, this is the song. Oh, so like, you had some stupid friends. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I, I, like, <laughs> I mean, that's the best friends, man. Yeah, you need stupid people around. <laughs> I do. It's, it's I mean, Oh, you, uh, truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> um, so they, uh, but they're like, oh, play that song again, play that song again. And then everyone's like, dude, you got to release that song. You wrote that song. And I'm like, bro, it was a joke. Like, it's not going to go on my album of my heartfelt songs of my life, you know? Why not? Like, you're, and then, you're a funny guy. That's what I, that's, and then I was like, you know what, screw it. Like, let's do a really, let's, let's go in and actually like produce this song out and, 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 and see what happens. And then we just had fun with it. And. Uh, got to make the really the, the vid music video and had mm -hmm. fun with that and made you know it was just a, it, it's just this like silly silly song and it's great reading the comments in YouTube because it's not a song that like if someone's like this is the worst song I've ever heard I'm like that's the point mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like you get it like or someone's like oh this song sounds like what you would get if you asked AI to write a song and I'm like yep that's thank a you. great yeah. that thank you too and then people are like this is the worst song I've ever heard but I can't stop listening to it and it's stuck in my head I'm like I mean, like the, everything is you know I'm like wow this is the first time I've like like read bad comments about my art and been like yeah you get it like this <laughs> is supposed to be bad you that's know the point. like what are you doing with bleach the beach the song makes no sense I'm like exactly Your like, mother doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but it, so it was just a fun, you know, a fun. And it was the, the last song, one of the last songs that I had written for the record. And so it was fun to just kind of end this like three year journey of finishing this crazy record that has a total crazy concept. I don't know where I came up. I, I was trying to think the other day, like, where did I come up? Why were we on an airplane and why? Is it like so? The the artwork is all like you're in a 1970s airplane, like Pan Am style, okay. like the golden era of commercial flight, when you you know every seat was first class. You dress up in a suit. They bring the 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 smoke was allowed. Yeah, you could yeah. smoke and the champagne. That was the day, uh, brother. Yeah. So um, <laughs> now you know you're in your pajamas and your hoodie and your headphones and your pillow and you're you're like you know in your tiny little seats. Some lady calling an alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> so uh, I really love that aesthetic. So I, I had that be like all the artwork and then I started incorporating all of those elements in the song. So like you hear the airplane sounds and I reference airplane and flying with in, in the lyrics and, and then I was like, Oh, we should be on an airplane, you know, like the album should be like so when you put your headphones on, you press play and it's like doo -doo 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 -doo, bing, ladies and gentlemen, welcome thank you for flying with Bell Air and <laughs> welcome to our flight and we're gonna have this da -da -da -da. and the, and the, like a flight attendant comes on and kind of like You know, buckle your seatbelt, sit back, relax, and enjoy okay, the ride. Right. And then the first song starts, and then I come and on as a they captain. They do the Macarena. And yeah, stuff, yeah, 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 exactly. They yeah. show the, you know, the, <laughs> this is the exit. You know, parachutes are over here, but we only have four of them <laughs> for the captain and the crew. Um, but they, so, so it just became this whole huge concept and uh, of, of being on this, like, musical journey through the skies. And throughout the whole record, there's you know you hear the captain come on and talk to you and take you into the next songs and the flight attendants and the sounds of the aircraft and um, coming in for the landing and the takeoff and everything and turbulence like we have you know oh we're going through some rough patches there's some turbulence then we have like these rock songs come on in that area and it just became this like really fun kind of like concept album and. Um, And we find like we're finally coming to the end. It's coming out in October, and it's crazy. Like like, I I I've been listening to. I don't have the, we we don't have it completely finished, mastered, ready like yet. But I'm listening to like it as as roughs, and it's like such a trip to have this crazy idea of this like massive undertaking of an album, and then 
you like listen to it in its entirety and you're like, whoa, like this is two hours of like you could literally put it on from a flight, flight to yeah. Mexico to Monterey and be like, yeah. like, okay, great. Like that I've, you know, and have this whole crazy journey. It's, it's, and that's it's really the, cool. the, the old school way, you know, uh, yeah. um, they used to, the, the albums used to be a, a theme. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I, I think that's cool. I, I really am heavily influenced by like, you know, the Beatles and, I know, um, and, and I'm gonna the magical mystery gonna tour, there, yeah. magical mystery tour, Sergeant Pepper, like they. I think more so, magical mystery tour is probably one of my biggest inspirations for this record, and and just in general, I think that that's just such a masterpiece, and it really does. If you if you really like take it song by song, that record, you realize like, oh my gosh, like we're they they're leading us up. Like there's a whole story. Yeah, that's a can, story that you can like. Roll up, you know, uh, get, get your tickets. We're, we're taking you on this magical mystery tour. And if you just think of that as like a song and then the next song as a song, but you like, if you like really like sit there concept. and kind of go psychedelic with yeah. it, you know, mm. like, yeah, yeah. like, you know, you yeah. get a little mushroom tea before you, yeah. before no, you, you know, but it, you can really go, you can really <laughs> find a linear line through each song and, and it blows your mind when it's all leading up to the last song in the album is all you need is love. You're like, Oh my God! You've been leading me to this like the whole time. Like you couldn't tell me the, the, the secret until the very end. And it's you know you can get psychedelic with it, but that's that that really influences like it's it's hard now with it's all singles and yeah. you're just like you got to drop a single a week and a single a month and there's nobody listens to full albums and you're like an yeah EP. but yeah or like an EP or like I'm like nah man like I gotta I this is what I, I, I so so I wanted to make this crazy massive concept album which. Yeah. Cool. And why did you decide to record La Camisa Negra? Um, well, I would play it live at concerts. Um, La Camisa Negra is actually on the record. Um, we, I would play it live at concerts, and people would just freak out, and they would have like they would love it, you know. And and so when I went in to make the record, I I had like De Desenamoraste on there, and yeah. I have another song called I Found Love that's kind of it's in Spang it's like Spanglish, and uh, Fuego Lento, Fuego Lento, uh, Diosa. And I've been like, so so I, but I loved La Camisa Negra. I love the song, and it's so much fun to play on the guitar. I love that Are guitar you a fan riff, of and yeah, yeah. Okay. And I love that. I love that guitar riff, and um, which uh, he must also, too, because he uses it in two songs. And I'm like, I'm like, wait, that's the La Camisa Negra <laughs> guitar riff. I can't remember the other song, the name of the other song, but I'm like, that's the same riff. You like that? You like that riff? But it's 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 fun to play on the guitar and. It's really fun to play live because the audience gets so into it. And then when I was making the record, we have a section of where you're flying over Mexico, and they're like, "Look out the windows, and you'll see the the pyramids and the you know the." Uh... Yeah, that was French. Um, they, I get, t I, I think of too many things in my brain, and my brain gets ahead of my words that are coming out of my mouth, so I get a little tongue tied. That's funny. My brain doesn't um, think at all. <laughs> I'll doesn't do it like for you. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so I, I, I was like, oh, we should put La Camisa Negra on the on the record. So I recorded it and then released it as a single. And also, uh, speaking of Te Desenamoraste, that's a very hard Spanish word to say. And it's yeah, it took a me a while to get on yeah, that Spanish. one. Uh, what was it like uh, writing it? it? Was it in English and someone translated for you or someone well, helped you difficult. with the grammar? That's the difficult thing about writing in Spanish is you can't really like, like I can't write a song and then just like give it to someone and be like, okay, just translate that. And they're like, well, we wouldn't really say this. And yeah. the way to say this, it's going to be too many syllables. Maybe the rhymes. And it's not going to rhyme. It's not going to work. So I, uh, I work with a couple of really talented songwriters, uh, um, in different situations, and, and it, it becomes like, all right, here's what I want to say. Here's the idea. Let's try. It. So, so it's kind of a collaborative effort. Because of, uh, you use the word intenso, mm -hmm. and that's a new word. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I was, yeah, we just came up with it. Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah. Does he know what intenso means? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Means intense. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in English you don't use that word, right? Yeah, we use that word. Oh, yeah, yeah. I never heard of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like thought you used toxic or... or something like that. No, it could be intense. It could be toxic. It could be. But intense in the relationship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, like, oh man, she's intense. Like, I, I, I can't deal with her anymore. It's, it's, she's too intense. Like, she's too toxic. She's too, ugh, she's a nightmare. <laughs> too toxic. Yeah. Uh, we really um, know uh, that you composed the Drake and Josh team, yeah. uh, which is a song to, uh, that talks about uh, uh, friendship. Mm -hmm. But that was the Drake as a kid. The, the new Drake, or this older Drake, is deeper. Um, and has no friends. <laughs> <laughs> You're better alone. <laughs> uh, what, what does You're this better Drake. Alone. Oh, how many times I've heard that. <laughs> what does this Drake prefer to talk about in songs? What is um, the main difference between this Drake and the. Honestly, it's a lot of the same stuff. I mean, I, I, it's, it's really just what's going on in my, in my world at the time, you know. And it's like, I think becoming a dad has a lot to do with, you know, my approach to songwriting. Uh, um, just relationships. Uh, it's, it's sort of kind of from the from the same place, just in a different point in in my life. Because now um, you're married and you have a son, right? Well, I'm no longer married, but thanks for bringing okay, that up. That's not a sore spot at all. <laughs> Fucking Wikipedia, man. <laughs> How long you been separated? I mean, I don't use it's it. It's empty. Uh, are you married? I'm married, yeah. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Don't ask years. me any advice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> ask me no advice. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> we, it's... No, but we, she's uh, an incredible mom. I mean, she's she. We have we have a great relationship, and and we have a beautiful son, and and he's just so, he's just, I mean, he's incredible, and uh, and she's a, just a wonderful, wonderful woman, and an incredible mom, and um, I I'm, you know, although we're not together, I mean, I couldn't be more right, blessed. Sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry about that. She's amazing. Let's talk about music. All right? Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I want to thank you for the song. I cannot relate. I really love it. And thank you. I'll tell you that I cannot relate it too. But uh, why is there a reference to a Barmisil commercial? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that put me out. Like, why? Well, it's actually interesting. So I, so, you know, I've gone through some shit. And when I was going through some pretty heavy stuff in my life, I I was able to do it's it's through it's like stories of my life, like okay. little sprinklets of yeah, little yeah, things yeah. and throughout my life. And I was at home and I was like wasn't touring and wasn't really working much. And I got a random call from Bottom of Seal, and they're like, hey, we'd love to do a campaign with you. And I'm like, uh, what is this? You know, <laughs> okay, like, wow, some, the phone's ringing at least. Like, let's check it out. And I got to do a really great campaign. That's how I met Lalo. Yeah. And it was just at a point in my life that I was like, what am I going to do, you know? And how am I going to make any money? And what am I like? I don't feel like touring and I'm not making records right now. I just, I was, I don't know. I was like in a blue mood and it was kind of like a, a like a knight in shining armor, like coming in and like okay. kind of boosting. And then I got, to, you know, I came back to Mexico and I met Lalo and we did the commercial and I was on set again and everything was great. And it just like, kind of gave me like this, like boost of like, bro, get the hell up. And like, nice. you can, like you can I mean, keep, you can, weird, keep no? like, you can keep going, you know. A cream save you. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's like you know, uh, apply twice daily and it'll bring you back to life. But I, I um, yeah. So in in the commercial, I mean, in the commercial, in <laughs> the uh, in the music video, uh, I was like, okay, let's put like little references. Like if you look in the Drake and Josh bedroom, there's like. You know, it says like Mexico, the Mexico flag, because we would have the American flag. So I replaced it with the Mexico flag. There's, there's like items in the room that I actually saved from the Drake and Josh set and like mm -hmm. put in the, so there were actually things from the show in there. And, and then the Barmacil thing. It was just like these little like, like just references that to me like meant a lot, you know, of like 
where I'm coming through. And then that was in the part where I say, you know, I found love in Mexico and yeah, nobody wants to hear me in the States and kind of gives me like, he's just like, just these little Easter uh, eggs. Yeah, I mean, you know? for me, the most powerful phrase is, I found beauty in my pain. Uh -huh. That's a beautiful line. That was the first line I wrote. What did you mean song. by that? That was the first line I wrote. I, I sat down at the piano. I think it was one of the first songs I wrote for the record. Um, but I just kind of, I just like, ding, a ding, I kind of relate. And it just like came out. A lot of times it's just stream of consciousness when I'm writing and it's like, I found beauty in my pain. And it was just like, it like hit me powerful. It was like so powerful because there's a lot of times when, I think when you're writing like stream of consciousness, it's, it's things come out that are inside that you wouldn't necessarily like think of. It just kind of like comes out and you're like, whoa, like, you know, and I just been in a, it was a really dark period and I, uh, I was going through so much, but also there were like beautiful things happening in this dark period. You know, I, I have my son and it's like, what, you know, how, how, how are these great things happening, you know, while all of this tragedy is happening at the same time, you know, and if I, if I focus on all the tragedy and just, you know, listen to all the naysayers and everything, everybody out in the world and, you know, take that to heart, well then this, like, I'm just gonna, it's just gonna be pure pain and I'm just gonna be destroyed. And then also like think, you know, bringing up things in my past, which we've, you know, have come to light recently and things that I've gone through and I've held inside for so long finally like kind of getting it out going and going to therapy being with my son having good things happen in this time of just total darkness i was like wait a minute like i could use these painful moments to transcend and like do better and be better and be a better father and be a better person and you know and, and there was a beauty in that, you know? And that came from, and I would sit there and I would think like, man, I wonder if I would recognize all of these great things and take, take these opportunities if I hadn't had the pain as well, you know? And so it was kind of like, wow, there's like a, you know, as much as it hurts and as hard as it is to go through and as, much as it just stays in you for the rest of your life, like there's a beauty in having that and like take ownership of it. It's like, yeah. you know, because you think through your whole life, you're like, why did this happen to me? And why is, why did I have to go through that? And, you know, you beat yourself up and you blame yourself and you go through all of this horrible shit. And then you go, you realize like, Wait a second, okay, so like, I like who I am. My friends like me. I, I, like, I, can, I like who I am when I'm alone by myself, creating art or watching a movie, whatever it is that you do when you're by yourself, you know, and you're like, I like that person, and that person came from all that. Yeah. So there's gotta be a beauty in that pain somewhere, you know, in being able to, you know, would I be the person that I like right now, like, without having all of that? And it was a struggle coming to that realization because for so many years of my life, I just was, you know, yeah, I, I think in, so. in, 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 in just, I was shaded by all of that. I was like, okay, I like why, th this happened to me, so I'm a damaged. I'm damaged goods. I, I can never be the person I want to be. I'll never be what you know. I, I the kind of person I want to be with others. I'll never be the, the, the you know. And slowly, and through a lot of work, you know, you kind of come out on the other side, and you realize, like, wait a second, like that all is part of my story. Yeah. That could help me help others. That could help me be the person that I want to be. Maybe that's maybe that happens so that I can do this. And then, and then that's where you know, I kind of relate. And then I kind of relate is like, wait a second, like, because you go through your whole life when you go through the junk that I've been through, going, 
nobody understands me. Nobody, nobody's been through, you don't get me. Yeah. You don't, you don't know what's happened you to me. Know. You haven't been through what I've been through. And then you start to, you know, go into group settings of like therapy or in, into, you know, AA type situations. And you're hearing all these stories and you're like, holy shit, I'm not alone. You, what happened to you? That happened to you too? This happened to you? Wait, okay, whoa, all right. Well, if that happened to you, I'll, I'll share my story. Like, yeah. cause that was really heavy and that was really brave of you to tell that. Like, okay, so, and then you start to like work through it and all this stuff that you kept inside, you start like processing it and working through it. And, and you realize like, whoa, I'm not alone. People do understand me. There are people, and now I can share my story and maybe I can tell people like, hey, no, no, no. Like, I relate to you. Yeah, don't feel ashamed. Yeah. And so that, that lyric, you know, I kind of relate. I, I found beauty in my pain, you know? So that, I don't know, it just came out like to kind of be that voice to, to other people saying like, dude, like you're not alone. Like you're not, you're not the only one going through this stuff. So like, you know. You're not alone, that, that's the line. Yeah. Well, the first time I, I heard the song, I was amazed by the chord uh, progression, the vocal arrangement. Uh, I was thinking, this is some Sgt. Pepper shit right here. And I, I like to uh, listen to a song, and after that, I search for the lyrics. Mm. And then I was, OK, again, but with the lyrics. And I was imagining the moment you write that, or you wrote that, sorry. And I was thinking, maybe he's remember that the first time you realized, I'm not a victim, I'm a warrior. Yeah. And that's beautiful, man. And I, I respect yeah. that. And I think it's also taking ownership. You know, it's like there's lyrics in the song where it's like, you know, I, I, I know I've done wrong, but I'm going to make it right. I know I've done wrong. You know, it's like that playing the victim and also realizing like, hey, you know, there was like, you've, the wrong, the, the, you know, I kind of relate. The wrong decisions that I've made. I, my golden days seem so far away, so I'm running away. And I'm, so there's like all these things of like, you know, understanding that your past plays a big role in, in who you become, um, but also deflecting every responsibility you've ever made in your life because something bad happened to you or something that it, it, it that doesn't help you at all. You know, you have to really take ownership, and so it just kind of became this song of like, you know, I've had shit happen, I've made bad decisions, I've fallen down, I've hurt other people, I've I've been hurt. I'm I'm just you know I'm human. Yeah. And it became sort of that a song of just kind of coming to terms and understanding just, you know, what the hell it is to just be a human on this planet and that other people go through the same shit, you know? Yeah. That that this is more personal because maybe people is going to be like, "Come on, Franco." <laughs> but uh and the song terrific. Yeah, you say Reason can compete with the drug that shares your name. Mm -hmm. And I, I was trying to, to figure out uh, who do you wrote this? Uh, did you write this song for, for you, for fame, for a, a person? Um, that was written with a songwriter named Sandre Lerke, who's an incredible, he's one of my favorite songwriters. Um, and so a lot of those lyrics came from him, but I what I what I see that is is uh, the drug that shares your name is you know she is the drug. Okay. You know I wouldn't say like I was dating a girl named Tusi or anything like that. You know? <laughs> um, this is my girlfriend. Yeah, this is my girlfriend Tusi. Her name <laughs> shares the drug. Uh, shares uh, the name with the drug. This no. is a uh, their sister crack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This is her brother, methamphetamines. <laughs> it's a very weird family. I don't understand. Their parents were hippies. They are intense as fuck. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just uh, and there's a lot of lyrics in that song that I really love that I relate to, like uh, um, "And there you are on cue where the light falls, waving at strangers, wearing your name out." Like it's it's sort of like being a star and being. Uh, Putting yourself on a pedestal and eating it, eating eating it all up, and and really, it's like 
oh, well, aren't you terrific? Well, look at you. Aren't you so terrific now? And you're like, dude, you have no idea. Like, you're so lame. Like, <laughs> you, you, you are not what you think you are. Like, knock it off. Okay, uh, you have participated in more than 20 And films. that could be about somebody, or it could okay. be about things that I've... <laughs> Could have been a little self-reflective, uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me do I it talk again. a lot, so okay. sorry. <laughs> um, there's this uh, fan theory that says that Drake and Joss were not uh, do the reborn, the like a uh, new series or mm -hmm. new movie, because there was this script that uh, left Drake in a bad light. Is, is that true? It's a fan theory. <laughs> uh, oh man, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, Josh and I would love to get back together. We would love to do something together again one day. Uh, you know, it would just have to be really uh, creative and fun. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> You, uh, I love your performance in superhero movie. It's oh, one of you. my fucking comedy favorite oh, movies. Oh, thank yeah, you. Man. That was so much fun to do. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, what well, was it like working with stars like Kevin Hart, Leslie Nielsen, and my personal hero, Christopher McDonald, a.k.a. Oh, Shooter my McGavin? God. I love, love, love Christopher, McD uh, Christopher McDonald. He is... He's funny. He's so funny. He's such a great actor. Um, but he just was so funny, and, and, and honestly, I mean, I've been doing this for so long that I've worked, and I've worked with so many people, you know, you know the, you, 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 there's good ones and there's bad ones. Okay. There's ones that you're like, I was a nightmare working with him, like, he was just so rude and didn't, wasn't prepared, or like, just, he was great on screen, but like, you don't want to work with him off screen, like, he's just mm -hmm. not a good, you know. But Chris was just incredible, I mean, he was like, so funny, so nice, so kind to the crew, so kind to everybody, such a pleasant, like, just the whole, every time he was on set, you just, like, everything felt relaxed. He was just one of the nicest actors I've ever worked with. He was just incredible. Um, I would, I, I mean, it would be, I would love to work with him again. A lot of actors I've had the opportunity to work with multiple times, but I only worked with him once, and it was a bummer because he's just incredible. Um, he's the kind of guy that, like, you know, at the end of the shoot, we, we ran out of budget because we had to go back and reshoot Okay. We were basically a, a spoof of Spider-Man. Yeah. But then the Weinsteins, who <laughs> produced the movie. Great Deans. Um, Bob was like, oh, it, it needs to be more like Scary Movie. You need to have more, uh, there's not enough superheroes in it. And we're like, well, yeah, it's a spoof on Spider-Man. Yeah. He's like, no, no, it's like X-Men. Like, put, put, put the X-Men in there and, 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 and put Superman in there. And I'm like... It's a spoof on Spider-Man. Yeah, like, so they basically like changed half the movie, and that sucked up our budget because we had to go back after we'd already finished the movie. We had to go back and reshoot like two weeks, three weeks of of fit. we had to basically shoot another movie. And so at the end of the movie, you know, you always have a wrap party. Yeah. And we didn't have a budget for a wrap party. Like we there were just no like, money. yeah, there was no money, and so we were like, it was the last day of shooting, and. Chris is, you know, comes up to me and he's like, he's like, hey, you know, I feel really bad. Like, crew's been working so hard on this movie, and there's no, you know, he's just gonna yell cut, and then everyone's gonna go home, and there's no rap party, there's no like celebrating the crew and everybody's involvement, and you know, getting to celebrate at the end. And he's like, he's like, what do we, let's do something at the end of the day. It was our last day of shooting. He's like, let's do something at the end of the day. Like, he's like, I'll order a bunch of champagne. I'll just like, you know, have a bunch of champagne delivered and. We'll get like some, you know, get someone to cater, and we'll just, we'll just like, do the rap party here, you know, and yeah. just like at cut, just I'll, we'll, we'll everything in. I'm like, bro, I'll go in halves. I'm like, that's a great idea. Like, let's do it. Like, he's like, he's like, all right, all right, cool. So, and then at the end of the the shoot, they're like, all right, and and nobody knew, like okay. only me and Chris What's knew. A surprise for the yeah, group? and then they were like, all right, and cut. That's a wrap. And then the elephant doors open, and they like wheeled in all this like champagne and catering and. And we had the rap party there, but that was how that was what it was like working with him. Like he just was He's he a good was person. A really good person. And working with Leslie Nielsen was just incredible. I mean Man. come on. Leslie Nielsen. I mean we yeah. Yeah, just, uh, police squad, naked gun. Naked gun is uh, it's just it's 
amazing. And the Zucker brothers who made the, the Naked Gun movies and the yeah. Airplane movies. I mean, Airplane, you know? Uh, so working with Leslie was just incredible. Um, also, a really, really funny guy. He, he loves his fart machine. He, used, <laughs> he has this little thing, and it, you, it's, like got gel, it's got like goo in it, and you kinda, it's like a little cup, and it goes... <laughs> and it makes like really realistic fart noises. Okay. And he would use it in the most inappropriate moments nice. all the time. Like he, you know, and you'd never know it was in his hand. He would just be like, the director would be talking to him, he'd be like... Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> and just no expression or anything, and make the noise, and just mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, okay. Or he'd be, they, they would do, they bring like you know people in from the press to do interviews and stuff, and he would be doing his interviews, and he'd just be like, mm-hmm, yeah. Well, it was really interesting to do, you know. Well, acting like nothing yeah, and happens. Yeah, just acting but... like nothing happens, and then he'd be like, hmm, <laughs> no. And it was even funny because, like, as he's getting older, because he was so old at that point, the, the you believe um, people are like, this real, yeah. oh, like we can't <laughs> we can't laugh and we can't stop because maybe maybe he doesn't, maybe it's an he's issue. old maybe Don't get yeah mad, maybe it's yeah. maybe it's an issue maybe maybe he doesn't hear it maybe he doesn't feel it maybe he doesn't know you know and he's just like and he would le- he would but walk he off smell? and laugh and he would walk off and laugh and just have such a he'd be like he'd be like just he was a great guy um, and then Marion Ross who was from. Uh, Happy Days. They played them all on Happy Days, which I grew up watching. It was amazing, and 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 Kevin was amazing. You know, I mean, it was just, it was just a really really fun. You know, I get to put on a superhero costume and walk around and fit, like as soon as you put on the muscle suit and the costume, you're like, you like feel like you, you could like, you feel like a yeah. Superhero. I'm like, I need to go save people. Like I need like yeah. I like I know we're busy shooting a movie, but like there is there are things that need to be saved in the world, and I can do it. Look at me, <laughs> you know. I look fine. Yeah. That. Uh, okay, uh, we had some pictures, uh, some photos that we want to show you, and you'll tell us about it, what you experienced in each occasion. Um, okay. okay. Vamos con la primera. Ahí está. Aw, look at that little guy. Um, <laughs> Which one are you? Season, that's for, I'm, I'm on the top right. Okay. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's the first season of, of, of The Amanda Show. Okay. And How old are you in this? I am... 13. Okay. I think I'm 13 there. Actually, I think that was before we started shooting. That was, I, I was probably 12 in that picture. Yeah. Maybe 13. I don't know. All right. I don't remember. Siguiente foto. And there's Nancy who plays our, who ended up playing our mom on Drake and Josh. She was on the first season. She was on, she was on Amanda's show with us. It's the same lady? Yeah. Yeah. That's our mom from Drake it and is. Josh. It is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Siguiente <laughs> foto. Wow. Okay. So this is on home improvement. Yeah. This had Team to be. Allen. This had to be. I think it was 1994. I was eight years old, and um, that was like I think one of my first sitcoms oh, that, yeah. I, that I did, and it was really cool because I I loved home improvement. Uh, as a kid, and and so getting on that that was really, really fun to be with Tim Allen and JTT and it was the first time in, in in the studio and yeah on on a on a set on for like set. a sitcom yeah. for yeah. like a sitcom like that we shot it over at Disney Studios which is one of my favorite lots. Did you feel like the the magic get broke when you saw? It's the whole weird. Thing? It yeah. is weird. It's weird because you don't realize that they're just sets like you really feel like the the rest of the stuff is there and you don't know that they're like right next to each other you know you mm -hmm. think like oh the house is here and they must shoot the the tool time set on another area and mm -hmm. it's like no it's like there's the house there's the living room and the kitchen there's the tool yeah, time set. Away, you're yeah. like what like yeah it's, it's 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 a trip when you really get to see it did you take a picture on, on the fence well you know what's awesome is getting to see what he really looks like Because you know the character of Wilson is always behind the fence, yeah. and even when they come out to do a curtain call, he has he made this little fence that he hold, that's handheld. Right. So even when he comes out for the audience and bows, he, the live audience is like, "Oh, we're gonna get to see what Wilson looks like in But the no. curtain call," and he comes out with a little a little mini fence, and you don't get that's to see him. Shit. So yeah, yeah. getting to see what he really looked like was a trip. Siguiente foto, por favor. You were in Seinfeld. Yeah, that's the. 
fourth to last episode of Seinfeld, the Frogger episode, that was that was that was unreal. I mean, because the it was were you a, a fan of Seinfeld? Yeah, and it's the number at, at that time. It's the highest rated show on yeah. TV. It was a, the and, final season, right? Yeah, and it's the final season. And there, it's like, why is Seinfeld ending? It's the number one show on TV. Because he wanted Because he wanted to. He's like, yeah, we've done, we've, we've I, done what we I needed need to do. Morning. Yeah, we did what we needed to do. And, and so it was really cool to be on there. Michael Richards was one of the nicest guys. Like, he. It's crazy. He would come backstage and like give all the guests like we were just guests on this like huge show you know and i say one line in the in the episode and when we were getting ready to do live audience like he was the only one that like came in and he's like he comes into the green room where all the like guest actors are waiting and he's like hey guys all right we're about to have, we're about to go on we're going to have a great show like you guys killed it in rehearsals like this is going to be great like and he just like it was just you know you know people don't do that they just like <laughs> Stay in their dressing room, so they need to come on. The guest stars are like, "Oh yeah, this is the person in, that's here this week that says those lines," and you know, they get that star behavior. But he was he was really cool. And then I got to work with Jason Alexander again on uh, the Fairly Odd Parents movies. Oh yeah, which was really cool. And uh, when he came onto the set, I was like, I was like, "Ha, that's funny. Like I was a cameo on your show, now you're a cameo in my movie. Like what a trip. Like what? Like it's so. I was like, I was the Frogger kid, and he's like." No way! You were the frog. No way! And uh, but yeah, it was kind of like a, a cool kind of little reunion. Is he a cool guy, right? He's awesome. Yeah. He's awesome, and he is like, he's your actor's actor. Like, you you sit down at lunch with Jason Alexander, and you go to like school. I mean, he t he's got all the stories of all the old actors, and he's had experiences with everyone. He's had the best stories. You hear, it's just it's like. It's like watching Robert Evans, the kid stays in the picture or something. Like he's just like Hollywood history. Okay, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a, he's a lot of fun. Siguiente imagen, por favor. Okay. Oh, that is that, that's from the uh, the commercial, right? Yeah, that's the Pokemon commercial. That's when you used to have to before you could do before like technology. Yeah. You know, before we had technology, we had. Uh, you plugged in the Game Boy, and then you plugged into your friend's Game Boy, and you could play together. Yeah, yeah you can But you had to be like, but you had to be like four feet away. This, this, this uh, commercial lies because I'm playing with a friend in the other apartment. Yeah, across the and, street. And the and the and her cable is like going all the way across <laughs> the room, no way. Uh, across the 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 street. And um, but yeah, so that was I. I was probably. That was before Drake and Josh, so I had to be. 11 or 12 in that one. Okay, so yeah. you were working. I was working constantly, yeah. yeah. Hey, I haven't market. stopped. ¿Cómo? Tenemos el comercial. A ver. ¿O no? Oh, we have the commercial. Oh. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what were the notes? Like, you play and that's it? Yeah. yeah Imagine just, a Pikachu. Yeah, and then, yep, yep, yep. And they're like, okay, look there. <laughs> look there, there's a Pikachu. And then your friend's going to... Yeah, yeah, see, they, the cables weren't that long. You could not play with your friend across the street. <laughs> I was probably, that was false advertising. <laughs> That's false advertising. Siguiente, por favor. Yeah, and so, yeah. I have, there's, I mean... That's I I I mean I couldn't even count how many commercials that I did. I've got it's it's crazy looking back on some of those. This was a hard one to find. Look at that. Oh, that's Amanda <laughs> teaching me the oops I did it again Britney Spears choreography. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Cuz we're a couple of kids on set and we're not, and we're bored. <laughs> we're they're they're setting up shots and she she loved Britney and she's got <laughs> she she's like, "No, you got to do it like this." And she's like, "Then you are, you know, You're not uh, such a dancer, right? <laughs> no, obviously. <laughs> you dance like a pool player. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so she, she had learned all the choreography to Britney's Oops, I Did It Again. And she's like, Drake, Drake, come here. I need to teach you the choreography for Oops, I Did It Again. And this is me doing the choreography to Oops, I Did It Again. Yeah. Siguiente video, por favor. Oh, this was a goldfish commercial I did. This was a campaign where it was actually kind of cool because they they put me on the goldfish boxes in the in the grocery stores, um, and it was like you something like win a guitar win a I don't know 
either why is there a when, a, when a concert or a guitar or something i don't i don't remember because it's the goldfish uh um the cracker snacks and they have like the gold they all oh, they had like the the goldfish floating oh, right here's a that was rectangular the goldfish character but anyway they uh <laughs> yeah they uh um, don't have fish you don't have goldfish here no yeah you guys do i mean come on no no Really? You guys have goldfish. You have, you have goldfish. Like yeah. a goldfish cracker? No. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Why? 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 They're good. Why do you guys need a, a, a cracker that has the form of a fish? Why? Uh, it's basically a cheese it, but looks like a fish. Okay. Yeah. A I don't. Fish. I that. You know what? I've never questioned it. I but do. they're really good. I do. They're know. really good. Um, Siguiente video. Okay. <laughs> this was right. This was like right when we started shooting Drake and Josh. Okay. This was, uh, an ad that I had done. I had just written the the theme song for the show, um, and this was just kind of like those things that go in between shows. It's like, hey, what's up? I'm I'm this kooky kid that plays guitar, and, <laughs> and I like to smile, and you know, I need to get a haircut. Siguiente video, por favor. Tenemos uno más. And there is the grandfather. That's the reunion. That's the reunion everyone was waiting for. Yeah, this was cool. Josh gave me a call. I was on tour, and I got a call from Josh, and he's like, "Hey, you know, I'm working, you know, uh, I'm working on this show, Grandfather." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know. I auditioned for your role, and I didn't get it." <laughs> um, but uh, I was like, "I was like, yeah, yeah." He's like, "He's like, the, the writers want to." Uh, do like a, a reunion of us. Like they want to bring you on an episode of the show. Would you would be would you be down? And I was like, hell yeah, dude. I'm like, I'd love to do. I'd, I'd, I'd do anything with you. Let's go. And so, uh, so yeah. So I got to go down to um, where did we shoot that? We shoot that at uh, Culver Studios, I think. No, not Culver Studios. We shoot it. At, it doesn't matter to your audience. I'm just reminiscing. Um, I don't remember what the name of the I studio mean, is. It was in Studio City. It was in Studio City. But uh, but yeah, so I got to go there and and uh, work with work with Josh and it was that was that was a lot of fun. You you said uh, you you did an audition for that part. Oh yeah, I did. Ah, is that true? Yeah. Is there a role you regret you didn't get it? Like man, I I, 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 I don't know now. Like thinking back, uh, um, you know what's interesting that happens a lot, which is kind of like, thank God in the industry is like there's a part you really want like you want this like uh, it usually happens with like a sitcom and you're like man I, I wanted that part and this kid got it and this guy got it like man I, I would have had a blast on that show and then it goes like two or three episodes and then gets canceled and you're like you touched the bullet oh thank god I wasn't on that show <laughs> so but I can't think of really like specific auditions that I Wish I'd have gotten that I didn't get. I can't. I, I'd have to like. That, I'd have I mean, that's good, man. That, you, yeah. You're great with. I mean, I you enjoy got, what I've done. You know, it's. Yeah. I've, I've been. That's a spirit. Yeah. Uh, I became. I mean, a long time ago, a huge fan uh, of your tweets. <laughs> oh boy! I start. What you. era of my Twitter account are you speaking of? Because <laughs> uh, there's a few. I mean, it was like, 15. Years ago, I, I can't recall the second date, but you were, um, I mean, I, I don't want to say fighting because you weren't fighting, just messing around with Justin Bieber. Yeah. What did it start that? <laughs> it started because I don't even know. Okay. The fans were wild <laughs> back then. <laughs> And... The, I just started getting attacked by like Justin Bieber fans, and I was like, "The, f <laughs> I was like what, like, like what?" So, you know, <laughs> I clapped back a few times, okay, and then it made it worse. A lot worse. So I was like, <laughs> so my every every day I would like open up my Twitter and it would just be like. Go die! You need to kill yourself because you you made fun of Justin Bieber. You deserve to die and mutilate yourself and hang yourself and kill yourself and drink poison. I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? I'm like, 
it's and and so like literally like I went to my because you know you can get away with some things if yeah. like if in your bio you write like comedian yeah yeah you know so I you're mean, like not at all yeah well not anymore not at all not anymore <laughs> but back in the day I used mean, to be like I, are you telling me people I'm a, are co- I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a comic I'm a comedian <laughs> like what I can say whatever you know come on that's what we do we, come on so I like went in there I'm like <laughs> comedian I'm like yeah, it's a joke you kids you know but it just started getting more visceral and horrible and I'm like I'm literally like waking up I'm like oh what a great day oh drink poison go die I'm like okay like, <laughs> good but morning like, uh, a hundred thousand of them and I'm just like oh my god like they're like we know what airplane you're on you're coming home from this place and we're gonna find you and kill you I'm like uh, I remember that yeah and, and actually you wrote back I'm in this <laughs> Terminal. I sent a picture of my ticket and the terminal number. <laughs> and they showed up. Nah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. I got off the train. But it was very it was very funny because they're like, they like, they we I showed up and I'm in the term I'm in the baggage claim and there's and they're like playing like Justin Bieber music and like they're all dancing around and they're like they're like they're like they're like <laughs> They're like, we came to destroy you, baby, baby. And I was like, I was like, there is no way. I live in an alternate universe right now. I'm like, there is no way this is real. And that lasted for about 10 seconds. And then they were like, actually, can we get a, can, I, can we get pictures with you? Can we get a, and I was like, oh, okay. Like, in person, in person. You're, <laughs> you're nice you're, in person. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, but anyway. Did you took the pictures? It, it was, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, um, nice. But it was... Uh, yeah, it just became like this whole thing. I, I was joking around, man. I was just poking fun. I was like, it's like, what, this is a, like, why are you guys taking this seriously? Like, this is, I'm joking. Like, whatever, but. <laughs> I yeah. have my favorite one. Uh, can we show the picture or the tweet? This is my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> Doing some writing. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I, I read it with your voice, man. <laughs> no. Yeah, right. I was like, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but no, I, I, I don't know. I think I got a little too, I, I took it a little too far. <laughs> I took it a little too far. And I took it so far because I, I, for some reason, I mean, like Justin Bieber was like on top of the world. Like, I'm like, like, there's no way Justin Bieber's doing, reading my tweets. Okay. Like he's not, like I'm I, like I'm so far down on the totem pole compared to like where Justin is, like I, I'm a fart in the wind to him. Like there's no way he's <laughs> he's reading my tweets. Did he? Oh yeah. No. Oh yeah, yeah. He was reading them. <laughs> so I had a I had an album release party for my red, for my record Ready Steady Go. And I have a friend who's a close friend of Justin's, or was, I don't know if they're anymore, but he was a close friend and he showed up to my album release party and he's like, he's like, Drake, Drake, I, I, gotta, I gotta talk to you, I gotta talk to you, it's really important. I was like, oh shoot, man, I'm about to go play, uh, I'm about to perform, uh, um, but hey, I'll, I'll see you in a minute. He's like, no, 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 bro, this is really important, like, I gotta tell you something. And I'm like, I'm about to go outside. Like, mm -hmm. Tell me later. You know, I'm like, I got I'm just, can't wait. too much shit to do. So I was like, tell me, tell me after. Well, <laughs> he what he was gonna tell me was what about was about to happen. And Justin Bieber shows up at my album release party nice. in his sprinter van and pulls in front of the the venue that I'm doing my album release party. And he had like sent a message to all his fans that he's like where he's gonna be, where he's gonna be. And then he sent a post. He t he put on his Instagram <laughs> a picture of me looking down because my friend, a friend of mine, took a picture of it <laughs> and then posted it on his stories. And Justin took that picture. And it's me looking down at Justin's van with his fans all swarming around. <laughs> and Justin's like, and Justin goes, um, why is why is why is Justin Bieber's sprinter van getting more attention than Drake Bell's album release party? No. And I was just like, touche. <laughs> well played. I respect it. I couldn't, I I I actually. I, I looked down and and I wish you had seen the other side because it's just from my back. But I I was looking down, just going, "Well played." Yeah, that's well a nice played. move. Good move. I'm 
full respect for the comedic timing of this of this clapback. So that was really funny. That that was funny. Yeah. Uh, hello to Justin. He always uh, see this show. So. Oh great. Yeah, yeah. He's a fan. Oh yeah. yeah. Nah. <laughs> We're going to do a little short break, and then when we return, there's going to be, um, how do you call it, a game? A game? Yeah, we're going to do a All game. All right, yeah. let's roll. It's, it's okay for you. So, yeah. quédense con nosotros, no se vayan, esto es desde el cero de la silla. En vivo no, bitches. <laughs> 